the issue about getting patients their results uh, directly. For those of you who don't know, it's probably become one of the central issues in the healthcare debate, is how do we get patients their results directly. A recent study by the Annals of Internal Medicine reported that 7% of patients, 7% do not get abnormal results told to them. Whether it's a mammogram of cancer, blood test, x-ray, they don't get the results. Recent, recent uh, launch of the website Health Data Rights says that patients have a right to their own medical information. They need to know the source, they need to have a copy, and they need to see it whenever they want. As we've heard earlier, the Meaningful Use Matrix, recently reported by HITECH, highlights some very specific issues. One of which is the Meaningful Use Criteria states that all patients have to get their test results, whatever test result that is, electronically within 96 hours. Our requirement. Members of Kaiser Permanente have viewed over 85 million test results. The members themselves directly reported to them. And the federal IT policy has recently held hearings in Washington expressing broad support for the issue of getting patients their results directly without physicians having to approve it. For those who don't know, 16 states in the, in the nation, including Florida, California, and New York, restrict patient access to their test data. You have to get that you can only get that data if the physician gives you permission to give the data. And the HIPAA privacy rule states specifically that only authorized physicians, uh, only authorized persons can get their data. Unfortunately, the patient is not considered an authorized person. So having said that, what I've asked the patient, what I've asked the panelists to address is a couple of issues. So the first is, in no particular order, uh, David, I guess I'll start off with you is what do you think of the issue about getting patients their results directly, leaving one of the largest healthcare systems, certainly in New York and the nation, what is the issue? Um, it's a complicated issue, and I would start off by saying there is no formal institutional perspective on this, but it is certainly a subject for very serious, honest, and intense debate, both at the hospital level and at the level of our local health information exchange. Um, let me be very clear, we want patients to have all the information that they need to make good decisions. We want knowledgeable patients, we want patients who are engaged, who participate in their care, um, and, and who can really contribute materially to their care. So we want to share information, um, and we do share information. That's not quite the same as sharing all data. Um, we have a real concern that patients have information that's actionable, and sometimes that means that the data needs to be processed. I think a patient deserves to see results. A patient also deserves to have the results contextualized, and that is part of the responsibility of a clinician. And I think the clinicians that we've spoken to in general feel uh, that they like the opportunity to review data in advance, contextualize it, and present it in a way so that patients really understand it and can make real decisions based on it. Um, fortunately, um, electronic medical records, information exchange, and the ability to process data um, really help that process and where we can process data uh, subject to, to evidence-based decision rules, we can provide patients with real actionable information. We can provide them with care considerations, tell them about drug-drug interactions, tell them about tests that need to be done, and tell them about results. But that is a different level of performance than simply providing them with data bits um, that really need to be digested. Um, I totally uh, support the uh, OMC's recommendation for a 96-hour time frame. It does give physicians a chance to review data, uh, provide meaningful explanations to patients so that they can deal with the data and a tripwire to ensure that patients always will have access to the data even if the physician hasn't reviewed it at that point. Mark? So uh, I spent 15 years in the banking industry and I'd just like to translate uh, some of that into banking. Uh, so I'd like to go into my bank and see my balance. Uh, well, before you can see your balance, you have to have a conversation with the Vice President who will inquire what you want to spend money on and discuss with you the wisdom of the decision. Uh, we have a fundamental problem with data access, which is uh, a long overhang history of paternalism towards people, and we'll call them patients, uh, about access to information. 
Um, when you get diagnosed with something from a doctor, how often do you actually get the name of the condition written down for you? Almost never. So I understand the point of very sensitive information in the case of sexually transmitted diseases and uh, mental health and uh, substance abuse information, but by and large, one does not require a consultation with a physician to see the results of one's blood test. Well, when I was uh, a practicing oncologist, I was at MD Anderson Cancer Center, we had an interesting habit of uh, sending patients from one part of our offices to another, and, and uh, just because we didn't have enough staff to carry their charts with them, we'd ask them to take their chart, with the understanding that they would often look at it. And that almost never caused a problem, except occasionally someone would say, what do you mean I'm obese, or something else would <laughs> broke the note. Uh, but uh, the patients would be able to look at their values, and it actually, we found, provoked uh, a, a good conversation with, with them. And I, I agree with the, the paternalism uh, comment. I think uh, it will happen. Patients will have uh, direct access to their records. Uh, in many ways it happens today, there's just a delay. You can request a copy of your records uh, from, from your physician's office and look at them all you like. And the sensitivity, of course, is when you see something that you don't understand because it's not information, it's just a data element. A blood value is abnormal. So my wife, when she gets a blood test, she wants a fax to her, she gets it, and she says, what does this mean? And as well as just your hemoglobin is slightly low, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but it provokes a lot of questions and concerns if you don't have the opportunity to explain. So I think what the answer is is not to continue to withhold the information, but to work out better processes, procedures, policies, where you can contextualize the information more rapidly for, for people, answer the questions that they have as they, as they get them, but understand it's their information and, and they, have a, they have a right to own it. Other comments? Yeah, just since I was expecting the uh, paternalism argument, I just want to respond by saying that there is an issue of patient anxiety, and I have to tell you, just as a practicing clinician, uh, when patients get results that haven't been explained, they do frequently respond to things that are not that clinically meaningful. And when I talk about context, it really is important to understand that a test result is not as simple as a range of normal. Um, there are variations within that range of normal. It really is an issue of probability. Each test has its own characteristics. Um, they each have their own predictive value, and they have to be interpreted in the context of clinical probability. All of those things are things that patients need to understand and that they should be helped to understand. I think the more quickly we can process information and give it to patients, the better off they are. I'm not talking about withholding, but I am talking about contextualizing. Okay, I'm going to move on to the second question, uh, which I've asked the uh, panel to consider, and that's the issue around meaningful use. And I don't want to debate, uh, we're not obviously going to debate the whole issue around uh, meaningful use. Uh, for those of you who heard earlier, it is, I guess, uh, I thought it was 556 pages, not 553. 25 measures to qualify for the federal incentives. The pages include, just briefly, or to entry prescribing, problemless, drug-to-drug -drug interactions, medication list, allergies, demographics, vital signs, smoking status, lab results, tracking aggregate patient conditions, tracking ambulatory quality issues, patients alerts, clinical decision support, claims eligibility, claims submission, providing patients with electronic access to the rules and information, medication reconcili reconciliation, clinical summaries, and syndromic data for public health authorities. One of the most recent popular health blocks are the following, meaningful use, or meaningless bureaucracy. The average doctor may have how much staff to implement it. Would it be sent to be enough? Would, most, or would many physicians actually leave Medicare? Would it push me, quote, over the edge? Would it eliminate the majority of small practices in the country? The investment in personal time, cost, maintenance far outweigh the incentive to adopt. The, uh, and then just paying for incentives doesn't mean it will happen. One of the more interesting quotes I saw was, any system that is not meaningful to doctors and patients, by definition, will never be meaningful. So having said that, I've asked the, uh, the panelists again, is this, where are you relative to your specific industry? Health system, consulting, and or Google. Where is your industry relative to meaningful use? And is it really gonna be what we think it's gonna be? Or is it really will 
will there be, in some sense, a significant backlash? Last bit. Um, well, there's, a, there's many aspects of this. Uh, one of the things we've learned in the last, say, decade for people who have been searching for information on the internet is that uh, people are, are very smart, they're very sophisticated, and when confronted with a diagnosis or a symptom uh, or some question of medication, they go online and they search, and they're very sophisticated. Increasingly, physicians uh, find the informed patient to be a very effective partner uh, in, in uh, dealing with conditions. Uh, so the reality is that, that many aspects of health reform are underway right now because people are searching for stuff. Um, they're, they're finding information. You know, when, when you look at the typical generalist who has 5,000 uh, patient interactions a year, uh, which means they spend 15 minutes with a person, um, that person has a hell of a lot more time and a hell of a lot more motivation to dig deeply into whatever is going on with them uh, than the practitioner does. And so meaningful use is going to be way beyond whatever this legislation creates by providing information to people and letting them be more fundamentally engaged. Uh, because the power of information to smart people, which by, by the way means most people, uh, is, is phenomenal. So the whole concept of meaningful use in electronic health records is certainly not new. 27 years ago, I was a resident at NYU. We implemented physician order entry. 27 years ago, it worked just fine. This is not new technology. This technology has been around for, for quite a while, and there are a number of organizations around the country that have adopted it, and there are a number of places that have been very slow. Small physician practices have been slow because that technology has not been mature, and there hasn't been much of a financial incentive for them. Uh, but large medical practices, for example, most notably Kaiser Permanente, spend a lot of money but get a tremendous amount of benefit. And if you talk to Kaiser physicians on the benefit they get, even in the office setting from having a fully integrated electronic health system uh, that takes what happens in their offices, what might happen in the hospital, can talk to their other colleagues and uh, get the whole picture, it's tremendously valuable. And in communities that we're seeing around the country that have made some progress in this, they're they're really deriving value. A great example, Evanston Northwestern, which is now called, to confuse all of us, North Shore something, uh, in, in Chicago, was an early adopter of Epic Clinical Systems. And uh, uh, they had uh, an ambulatory implementation. Uh, some of their cardiologists decided to leave that organization and go out into practice on their own. They said, we don't need this Epic system any longer. We'll do, you know, it'll be part of our own practice. They immediately realized that their referrals were shrinking. They didn't get the, the kind of uh, patient volume that they had. They couldn't communicate with the other physicians in the community that they were used to. So they went back and to Evanston, Northwestern, or North Shore and said, hey, can we buy that system again from you? And can we use it? And that was some of the value that they, they derived. So I think what the whole rules around meaningful use are doing are just serving as an accelerator to something that was happening already. It is not uh, you know, tremendously groundbreaking or innovative or new. And what we are seeing is while some people are still sitting on the sidelines or waiting for the final rules to come out in, in the spring of this year, whenever, whenever that might be, uh, most organizations and physician practices are moving forward fairly rapidly. Uh, I had a meeting, for example, with the executives from uh, one of the uh, larger uh, EHR companies uh, a couple of weeks ago. They have a backlog of 200 hospitals that need to want to upgrade so that they can achieve meaningful use uh, and uh, uh, they don't have enough people to, to staff all that and are looking to the consulting industry to uh, help them, uh, looking to their uh, uh, people in the hospitals, perhaps the regional extension centers to help move those kinds of things uh, along. So we're seeing tremendous activity uh, pretty much nationwide, uh, certainly at the uh, level of hospitals and hospital systems. Uh, but also at the uh, physician practice uh, uh, level. And when I speak uh, informally to colleagues who have the onesie, twosie, threesie medical practices, which is the majority still in this country, uh, as we heard earlier, uh, they are aware of this. They are moving towards it. They're trying to figure out uh, how to get the funds. Some hospitals are also funding this uh, for them with the relaxation of stark regulations. 
And if you look at some of the big ambulatory vendors like uh, NextGen, Allscripts, uh, eClinical Works, these guys are really, really busy. They're cranking out the contracts uh, like never before. So in, in terms of the intended impact of stimulating uh, progress in this, it has been so far effective. Now, all the devil will be in the details of whether or not uh, uh, people will be able to finish this in time to get the incentive payments or avoid penalties, what some of the capital poor uh, practices or hospitals such as critical access hospitals and federally qualified health centers will do, will they actually get penalized if they don't do it? I think those things remain a question we can, we can talk more about, but uh, it, it's, we're certainly seeing the acceleration happen. David, may please. Yeah, I would uh, echo those sentiments. What we have seen is that the meaningful use, even the planning for meaningful use, um, has been a catalyst driving systems forward. And as you say, the devil's in the details. Uh, every organization is in a different place. Maimonides actually has the luxury of already having uh, physician order entry and results retrieval for well over a decade of full documentation, of electronic record in our outpatient department, perinatal services, emergency department, cancer center, um, all of which are integrated. And it seemed the next step was really to move toward integration with other institutions that served our patients appropriately. And that was the genesis for a health information exchange, all of which was really accelerated by planning for what we anticipated as part of meaningful use uh, criteria. It's interesting that the physicians who already participated at the hospital level in physician order entry were really excited by the notion of having access to data from all of the institutions taking care of their patients. Um, and have really been um, very participatory in discussions moving this forward. I think it's also clear that they are very anxious about having legacy systems. Uh, we've long been waiting for standards to be set, and it's high time that, that they are being set. Um, it will help drive us forward, and I think that is a material change in uh, the new regulations um, moving, moving things forward even further. So let me, which is a great segue to the last question, push back a little bit. Um, and that's the issue around actually EMR adoption. Now, you're at the Lawrence Medical Center, obviously the physicians who practice in a hospital environment are very different than those who try to practice. And I'm sure uh, you know, Mark would agree that the uptake of Google Health has not been what it is, although it is a PHR, not a full-fledged uh, EMR. Um, right now, less than 10% of the physicians in practice in the country actually have adopted an EMR. And actually, if you look at the, we talked about earlier, the small physician practices of either 10 physicians or less, it's even, it's even less than that. Um, so they're really essentially 90% of the physicians in the country in small practices have not adopted an EMR, despite the incentives, despite everything that's going on, despite the uh, money that's pouring into this from the federal government. There are three major gaps that we've uh, looked at relative to adoption, three different categories. One is what we call deployment gap, which is inadequate broadband access, especially in rural areas. The second is the connectivity gap, that even when available, physicians actually choose not to connect because of the cost of broadband and some other issues, but they actually make the decision we're not going to connect anyway. And then it's the utilization gap. And the utilization gap is when physicians fail to see the advantages. They lack the time to train and use. They lack the staff time to train and use. And essentially, probably what I believe, certainly is one of the biggest issues, they are still unwilling to alter their workflow habits. Um, and they resist, particularly the issues around decision support. Essentially, that means is, you know, for you to tell me how to practice medicine. So having said that, is what are each of you seeing in your industry relative to EMR adoption, and is there anything else we can do to fix it? So uh, I, I challenge the, the uh, claim that physicians aren't willing to change their workflows. I think what they're not willing to do is be straight-jacketed into workflows designed by people who actually don't understand how they work. Um, and this sort of goes back to who remembers Lexus and Nexus? Okay, horrible systems that predated uh, modern search technology. Uh, and they had a particular underlying design that, that came out of sort of thinking about information the wrong way. And what I see in the EMR systems that are, are now being put together and integrated in this way is very rigid controls over how data is coded and that it has to be coded very precisely in taxonomies with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, 
terms. Uh, and, and the doctors naturally uh, are concerned by the constraints on their, on their behavior. Um, so, so the place we're going to end up at some point is a, a less constrained world in which the doctors can write down in text, uh, like an email, what it is that they observe and what they think. And later on, we'll add smarts, pattern matching, and search technology that will let uh, that will let that stuff be more useful. Um, but let's start simple, uh, rather than incredibly complicated. Well, I think we still have some challenges about uh, adoption, and, and part of it is is the way some of the current systems are are configured or meant to work. Um, on the other hand, a lot of it is cultural. So, for example, if you go to um, New York Hospital and you try to get them to change the way they, they do their work, they'll, they might refuse. Uh, but if a prominent physician from New York Hospital were to move to UCLA Hospital and decide to practice there, when that person arrives, they're not going to say, oh no, we have to do it the way we did at New York Hospital. They're going to do it whatever way UCLA does. They're going to completely change the way they did their work. And it has to do with setting expectations. Uh, and, and remarkably, when uh, a hospital builds a new building, it's a great opportunity to change the way you work. Because people expect, oh, I'm going to be in a new building. Maybe I'll do my work differently. So overcoming those cultural challenges, I think, are a, a, a big piece of uh, uh, clinician adoption. Uh, at Deloitte, we've been working on this for a number of years. We have uh, you know, uh, toolkits, uh, uh, clinical adoption toolkits that we use that are are pretty successful, uh, but the most important aspect of the change is having uh, internal leadership, uh, particularly physician leadership, at an organization that helps uh, helps drive to some of the change. Now, I do want to dispute one of the figures you, you mentioned about EHR uh, adoption being as low as nine or ten percent. Uh, uh, recently, uh, you know, there's there's two buckets of money for uh, uh, incentive programs around electronic health records. The Division B incentives are the Medicare and Medicaid uh, dollars that come to an organization or a physician. A bunch of applications went in. Rumor has it over 150 communities applied for Beacon Community Grants, which is how to accelerate the adoption of electronic health records and be able, within a community setting, to communicate information between practices and hospitals, achieve uh, coordination of care, enable bundle payments, and, and enablement of the medical home and concepts like that. Uh, so tremendous interest around the country. Uh, I helped a couple of communities uh, work on this. One was the uh, city of Houston, the other was Orange County, California. And in both cases, there was actually data available that said, uh, in the case of Houston, over 40% of physician offices had already purchased an electronic health record. Now, it didn't say exactly how they were using it, and I don't think they were using it to its full capabilities. But a lot of uh, these uh, physician practices have already purchased uh, and are in process of implementing uh, to uh, one, one form or another. And, and I do think there is a general awareness of uh, we can't be left behind. So 10 years ago, if I was working with the hospital system, they would be saying, oh, gee, we're not sure our doctors will you know, accept this. It was a very well-publicized failure at Cedar sinai when they tried to implement uh, a physician order entry and they had the medical staff and the report from the LA Times confronting the CEO and saying, turn it off, we don't want to use it. Uh, they're about to go live again with physician order entry. Uh, uh, the, the medical staff have really a different attitude about it. It's, gee, how come we haven't done this sooner? Which is an attitude that many physicians have. Uh, it's, it's about time. If you walk around, particularly any teaching organization, uh, the, uh, the younger physicians are all plugged in with uh, PDAs and iPhones, et cetera, that have a variety of medical applications on it. And uh, we're hearing now more why can't we move faster? Why are we going so slow? How come we don't have enough money for this? As opposed to, no, I don't want to use uh, something electronic in my office. That's not to say there still aren't plenty of holdouts. There are. Uh, but the, I think the, uh, the, the game has really changed over the last decade. Okay. So as one of those 150 or so beacon hopefuls, um, I, I would validate the, uh, the notion that the adoption, at least in our area, is high. And there is no question that physicians are chomping at the bit to adopt um, if, if, if they're given support. But that support has to be at multiple levels. And um, we also do deal with those cultural issues of adoption. And I'd say the great point is somewhere around my age. <laughs> those older aren't about to invest a lot of capital in something that they don't intend to see 
uh, function for the next decade or two, and those young girls want things to happen much more quickly. So there is the initial capital issue, um, there is the selection issue that um, is, is really a very important one because one system doesn't fit all kinds of practices, from big practices to the onesie twosies in our community. Um, and then there's the issue of implementation, workflow, and ongoing maintenance and support that is um, binding to, to some of those individuals. That said, um, we really do have a very widespread, widespread penetration in our community. Um, at the EHR level, which we know is necessary but not sufficient, uh, when we actually look at achievement of meaningful use through the use of those EHRs, we have a great deal of work to do. And really, the game is not just putting data into a system. The game is being able to share those data, to manage care more effectively, to get those data out to patients, to engage them in their care, um, to start looking at broad community-based data and improve the quality of services. Uh, I think that that's, as you said, what, what the Beacon communities want to achieve. That's where we would certainly like to go, and there is a lot of distance between here and there. Okay, so there's a, there's a couple more issues I want to address, but I promised Rich I would uh, open it up for questions first. Unless, uh, so are there any questions that the audience has for the panel? Um, yeah, I, I think we talked about yesterday's issues. The world solved. It's just like you've got unfiltered data. They're going to own it. It's going to be their own data. The question is whether you gel them the process of any process. And so I have a question for you. This is the one where I think we're going to react. When will some business be developed? And which one of you will do it? That will give a patient not only the data, but as soon as they leave the office on their whatever, or whatever else electronically they have their quality score. That will say half of the things the doctor should have done, they didn't do it. Here they are. Why do you ask the doctor why he didn't do it? Or he ordered these things that make no sense. Or if he ordered these drugs, you could save this amount of money in pharmacy as opposed to this. So what is useful data that synthesize about quality, cost, and value? And what business coalition in New York or California is going to put together a business plan to actually produce the transformation that will get us out of the need to ration healthcare? Uh, it's not going to come from the industry. Doctors won't do it. Hospitals in New York proved in the paper as far as I read that they won't do it. And uh, nobody else seems to want to do it. So when is this going to happen? Uh, and what business the coalition is going to make this happen? And by the way, I really believe it's going to be done by women and not by men, but that's the uh, your secretary <laughs> Okay, so I agree with you about the women thing. <laughs> um, I'll take the first shot and then uh, give it to the panel. I mean, if you, I, I agree with you hundred percent. If you, if you really, if you listen to what you know, New Vintage actually said, what he said at the end was he was very, very specific about a patient-centric healthcare system and the individual. And the first topic we talked about at this panel was what I believe, or some of us believe, is the first step. Patients will not be empowered to make decisions until they have the information to make the decisions. Right now, there are significant barriers to getting basic information to patients in at least, however many carry in 26 or 28 states across the country. Uh, so that has to be fixed, and that's going to be probably a legislative fix, fix in the end. But we agree with you. I would love to get patients updated tomorrow so that they can make decisions. I, I do believe that we are probably still in this paternalistic system of where physicians, I'm a physician, you know, are sort of still believe they own the information and they have to tell their patients the data. Um, the fact is, the data, whether it's test results or x-rays or whatever test results you want, it's not ours. It's the patient's. It's theirs to decide who gets it. It's theirs to decide what to do with it. So that's the paradigm <coughs> that we're looking for. And I would ask the panel to you know, what their thoughts are. Yeah. Uh I have to thank you, Bob. You, you've actually made the point more urgently that, that I was trying to make earlier, and that is there is a real need to provide patients not with data, but with real processed, actionable information. Um, and I think that that's exactly what we are beginning to attempt to do through our health information exchanges with multiple data sources, feeding that through a care engine powered by clinical decision rules that are evidence-based that can provide patients real-time 
um, with the issues that they need to address with their position. Ideally, that could be made available to them at the time of an office visit. Certainly, it should be made to them, available to them through a patient portal so that they can communicate that back to their physician. You know, I, I do think we uh, are starting to make progress in this, and I, well, I don't think individual physicians are necessarily the ones who are driving this. I do think healthcare provider organizations can drive greater transparency around quality outcomes and, and options. So, for example, uh, one, one of my uh, clients that we've been working with uh, on uh, the West Coast does more joint uh, replacements than any other organization out there. And the CEO of that organization says, I don't want to just know how much blood you lost in the operating room or how fast you got out of the hospital. Those things are important, but why did you have the knee replacement? It's because you couldn't play tennis or golf anymore. And three or six months after the surgery, we were able to go return to playing tennis or golf. And how are the results from my organization compared to some of my peers? And it's a critical aspect of strategic thinking of many provider organizations uh, on how they're going to be driving their businesses in the future. So one of the strategies of many provider organizations is to not just be in the inpatient business, but be in the healthcare coordination business. So many are, are thinking on how to do that. And part of that is linking into physician practices, uh, whether it's buying them or partnering with or just exchanging information with to be able to prove uh, superior outcomes compared to uh, the, those peer organizations. And they think that's going to drive more business them, and I think they're probably right. If you look at some of the data that comes out of the Deloitte uh, study on, con on consumer attitudes towards healthcare, and we're getting ready to re release the, the last study, 5,000 consumers from around, around the U.S., uh, most of them want to access their own healthcare results uh, online, and then most of them want to be able to uh, uh, have uh, comparative data on outcomes from their healthcare providers so that they can uh, uh, make their own choices. And I think it's something that as baby boomers access more and more healthcare in the next couple of decades, uh, that's going to be driven uh, further along. So I think there's a, a, a combination of forces that will do that. So at a more pragmatic level, uh, right now uh, it's possible, given the way Google Health is built for you, if you want to go into the business of writing software that an individual user can connect up to their Google Health profile, which will do the things that you described. Um, and there are, I don't know, dozens of third-party applications uh, deployed today that, that uh, connect up to the, uh, to the existing Google Health profile machinery. Um, we're only at the starting stages of that, but uh, it's clear that the, that the capability is very straightforward. Back here comment and question to this panel. So I hear you guys talking a lot about as a patient, me owning my data. So being in technology, I'm not so sure the battle is about me owning my data because I want my doctor engaged in the discussion. So do you believe that it's going to be an expectation of us as patients that our doctors are actually able to access the data and have a discussion with me about my data? Because we just get access to all of that data and I'm looking at it and can't read the values, it means nothing to me. I got access to it, but it could be. So getting access with my doctor in the room when we're having a discussion is probably the most valuable piece. Do you believe it's a generational thing? And that it's just going to take time. Because you look at the young doctor, it's fine, and they've got the iPhone, and iPod, and things that nature, and I look at our children and the technology. I was just with my doctor, who was an older doctor, who was very frustrated with the fact that he's got looking at this technology and, and he's only going to be able to see two patients a day because he's got the technology piece. It's just a matter of time, one, but more importantly is it about the conversation with me and my doctor versus me just only my care. So, so um, I, we, we've talked to a lot of doctors and I don't actually see, I mean this is, you know, anecdotal and not systematic, so take it with a grain of salt. I don't see a generational thing. I don't see older doctors saying no and younger doctors saying yes. I see lots of doctors of all age groups uh, very excited about it, but very concerned about how do they integrate it into their cost structure, how do they actually make it work for them, and how do they avoid a, a sort of an overwhelming overload of, of noise. Uh, so, so it's going to be very important to provide powerful ways to organize the information so that the doctor can focus his or her attention on the salient things, not on, gee, here's you know, a gigabyte of stuff. 
Yeah, I, I think another, I agree with that, and I'll add on to that. Uh, part of this is not just about uh, an individual, whether it's a physician or a, a person having their data. It's how do you integrate multiple sources of information together? And I think the health information exchange movement is really uh, taking great strides in that direction. Uh, the industry is kind of crowded with vendors who claim to have health information exchanges. It's clearly going to be a shakeout as a, a few dominant players uh, emerge. But the ability for the physician that you see to not only see the things that he ordered for you or she ordered for you, but what was also done by other providers in the community, uh, be it a, a laboratory or a diagnostic imaging center or a primary care physician specialist, how do you integrate that information together so it becomes cohesive? I think one of the reasons that uh, the Obama administration talks quite a bit about organizations like Kaiser Permanente and Intermountain Healthcare and Geisinger is they kind of have those integrated systems already, but those places took decades to build. And how do you do that in the real world, which are which is a community of hospitals that is that are often competing and doctors who are competing and sort of cooperating? Uh, so that the ultimate interests of, of their patients are served. And the health information exchanges are an important step in that direction, not the whole solution yet. Well, I think the whole movement, again, toward coordinating data and integrating data into meaningful use has really helped with that situation. Um, it would have been inconceivable in Brooklyn uh, a decade ago to have all of the organizations participating in the current information exchange in one room setting policies that really affect us all. Um, but as a result of that, we really already have a system now where the kinds of data that you would like your doctor to discuss with you are coming right to that doctor's office and they have the ability to review it and discuss it um, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, with with you, um, and that really is the end product that we're looking for. And we are uh, out of time, I'm told. So again, thank you, Lloyd, for putting this together, and for letting all the participants. Thank you.